Um, all righty then. Uh, it's six o'clock on the dot here in Nashville. Hello everyone. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Carmen Tong. I'm the second year clinical fellow here at Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. It's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you all my Professor of Pediatric Urology at Vanderbilt, Dr. Stacy Tanaka, who will be talking to us today about pediatric spina bifida. Thank you, Carmen. Um, so Carmen is great. She is our graduating fellow, and she is going to be starting at University of Alabama, Birmingham, um, to be with David Joseph as soon as she finishes. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Hillary, um, uh, Hillary Kopp and on the group at SPF for, for UCSF for coming up with this great idea and implementing it so quickly. Um, you know, I was able to listen to a couple of the lectures and I hope that my lecture kind of lives up to what I've seen so far. Um, I was also able to see um, Dr. Elizabeth Yorkey's lecture last week and I hope that this sort of complements what she talked about. And so, I'm um, talking about pediatric spina bifida. I don't have any relevant disclosures. I am part of the umpire CDC group, um, and this talk doesn't necessarily represent um, the thoughts of that group. So I've got three introductory slides, and I, I, these are the slides of, or these are this is the information about spina bifida that I like to keep in my mind as I'm treating patients and as I'm thinking about research about spina bifida. Um, this first slide is pretty introductory. It's it's something that you probably all know. Um, spina bifida is a neural tube defect that can have medical issues associated with it, um, including cognitive cognitive development issues, um, hydrocephalus mobility and orthopedic issues in addition to the urologic issues that we see related to the bladder, to the bowel, to, to reproductive and sexual function. Um, spina bifida is a broad classification. Um, mostly in my mind when I think about spina bifida, I'm thinking about myelomeningocele, the most severe form. Um, but spina bifida also includes meningocele, lipomyelomeningocele, and spina bifida occulta. And so specifically, when, when I'm looking at studies about spina bifida, I'm really careful to look at what that patient population is. Um, you know, am I looking for at results for a broad, for that broad category of spina bifida, where you might expect less severe results or, or, or better outcomes, or is this just a purely myelomeningocele group? So that's one thing I keep in my mind. The other thing that I keep in my mind is, is that the global prevalence of spina bifida just really varies um, by geographic region. So first, internationally, um, it, so green is, is a lower prevalence, red is a higher prevalence. I think it's important to remember, um, especially in the United States where geographically we're not as connected to other countries, that we've got a lot to learn from other countries where spina bifida rates are high, where the prevalence is very high. Um, the other thing that I, I like to keep in, in focus is, is that even though the United States is green, that overall there's a low prevalence um, compared to globally, that really there's a lot of variation within the United States. And so in your training or in your practice, you may see very few spina bifida patients you may see a lot, but even if you're seeing one, it's important to get that collaboration with others just because things are changing so rapidly that what may have been dogma, you know, 10 years ago is really something that we're thinking about differently. And so to, to kind of keep that up and, and depend on your colleagues and for us to learn from each other. The third and final thing that I keep in mind is, is that uh, and all of you probably know this as well, is, is life expectancy for individuals with spina bifida is increasing. Um, and obviously it has to do a lot with a lot of things not necessarily related to urology, but huge implications for what we do as urologists because our interventions need to be good not for just, you know, 30 days in that post-operative period where you're looking at complications, but we need to be good 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, what the, the way that I've separated this talk is I'm gonna be talking about kidney function. 
um, and then sexual and reproductive function, and then continence. And others have said this more eloquently, but really, kidney function is, is your main focus of spina bifida care. Um, the other things are important, but you don't want to sacrifice kidney function for other things that are, are quality of life issues. Um, uh, those other things are important, but you, you want to be, but you can't improve quality of life if you don't have a life to live. So let me start first with kidney function. Um, most individuals born with spina bifida have normal kidneys. So in historical series, 90 to 95% have had a normal urinary tract when they were first evaluated. Um, in more contemporary series, so in our uh, umpire study group, um, renal bladder ultrasound was normal in the majority of patients. In patients who had abnormalities, it was typically mild hydronephrosis. Um, we weren't able to get DMSA scans in all of these babies, but in those that we were, the majority had no renal defects. Um, I, I mentioned, I keep mentioning umpires, so I'm going to talk just a little, just briefly on that. Um, this is a, a CDC um, study to look at the urologic management to preserve in initial renal function in young children with spina bifida. So infants are recruited at birth and are studied on a standardized protocol, um, uh, iterative, iterative quality improvement protocol. All these patients have myelomeningocele. Um, and there are nine funded sites and, and enrollment started in 2015. So why is renal function so important? Why is this such a big issue? So before, um, in the past, renal disease, chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease was a big problem for individuals with spina bifida. As individuals were first beginning to survive into adulthood, um, the main cause of death was really uh, renal causes. So in a historical series of, of adults born in 1944 and later, they were able to identify 56 deaths with known cause, and one-third of those were from um, kidney-related complications. Now we're doing a lot better now um, in a more contemporary series of over a thousand adults with spina bifida with a mean age in the mid 20s. Um, only a quarter had chronic kidney disease and very few, less than 2% had end stage renal disease. But really we need to do better. So again, thinking about that graph about life expectancy in spina bifida, um, if you're expecting, if your expected life, expect, if your expected life expectancy is into your 70s and 80s, for a quarter of that population to have chronic kidney disease in their mid-20s is huge. And looking at data from the U.S. renal data system, um, the average the onset of end-stage renal disease in spina bifida was in the early 40s. Um, so what's helped to in, improve kidney disease? Now, the main thing is CIC and anticholinergics. So um, anticholinergics reduce bladder pressure, nutrients or overactivity. Um, we're a little bit limited on, on the different ones that we can use, mostly because liquid formulation in the United States um, can really only get oxybutynin, and oxybutynin is the only FDA-approved anticholinergic for pediatric neurogenic bladder dysfunction. Um, there are some children who can't tolerate it um, for heat intolerance um, of flushing or concerns that parents will bring up. Um, some families, um, some parents who um, are also sort of uh, medically sophisticated are also concerned about the cognitive effects. Um, certainly, if you're just out of training and you've been in, in residency recently, you know, obviously there's concerns about oxybutynin and its use in the elderly because of that tie with dementia. Um, and, and that's because there are muscarinic receptors in the brain. Now, when they looked at this in children with spina bifida, there, there was a small double-blind study um, that looked at this and didn't see any short-term memory effects but that study was small. Um, it, it didn't really look at long-term effects. And so I think that there's, I think that if parents are concerned about it, I think you do need to take that seriously. Um, there, um, the, uh, unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of other options. Um, there are other routes. Um, you can do intravesical, which you know, shouldn't really uh, elevate the levels too uh, much in the bloodstream. There's transdermal. Um, and there are other medicines available, selective antimuscarinics, um, beta-free adrenergic agonists. 
again, not FDA approved for pediatric neurogenic um, bladder dysfunction, but also more realistically, not in a liquid formulation that you can give to infants. Um, so we know that CIC and anticholinergics can help preserve renal function. So who needs it? And there have really been three approaches um, to doing this. Um, the EAU, ESPU has come up um, recently with, with two manuscripts about guidelines for the neurogenic bladder. And what their recommendations are, are to start CIC in everyone. Um, and then to start anticholinergic based on neurodynamics. Um, their rationale is, is that it maximally preserves renal function and that families are more able to do CIC if they start it early. Um, there's a, a proactive approach um, that was um, first introduced by Dr. Stuart Bauer, um, and that was just by identifying to see, um, looking at bladder characteristics to see if the bladder was high risk. And so starting CIC and anticholinergic based on urodynamics. And essentially, this is the strategy being used for umpire. And there's also a, a reactive approach um, where you wait to see um, upper tract changes um, in the kidney, such as hydronephrosis or reflux. Um, there is some emerging evidence um, that we've looked at in our own population where you can, uh, um, based on um, estimated GFR, that even with normal ultrasounds, there's some subset of the population who can have chronic kidney disease while still having a normal appearing ultrasound. Um, so that, that middle strategy, that proactive approach is, is based on neurodynamics. And for decades, um, there are some, we've known that there are some neurodynamic findings that are associated with renal deterioration. Um, the first is detrusor sphincter dysenergia, and this is a, a fairly simple concept. Um, in the normal bladder, the external sphincter relaxes when the bladder muscle contracts. In, in some individuals with spina bifida, those two muscles, the bladder muscle and the external sphincter, are discoordinated or are dysenergic, and so they're contracting at the same time. Um, the other urodynamic finding that's associated with renal deterioration is detrusor leak point pressure. Um, in a non-compliant bladder, the bladder pressure is going to increase as the volume fills up. Um, if your bladder outlet is low, the, the pressure, you'll leak before your pressure gets very high. But if your urethral outlet resistance is higher, um, it will um, let that pressure rise up into a point which is called the detrusor leak point pressure, and that's the pressure uh, of leakage. That's a pressure where you have leakage in a non-compliant bladder in the absence of a contraction. So theoretically, or, or um, you know, in, in text, these are very simple concepts, but they're a little bit harder to apply um, um, in practice. So um, Dr. Ann Dudley looked at this, um, providing urodynamic samples to urologists who, who looked at or uh, come, were familiar with neurogenic bladder, and found that there was a very subjective um, interpretation of known risk factors, like detrusor sphincter dysenergia and detrusor leak point pressure, that there's a very low inter-rater reliability. And so um, these are ordered in uh, order of highest inter-rater reliability to lowest at the bottom. Um, and so um, infill pressure is, is okay. Um, it's, it's not great, it's, it's still considered low. But the things that you would look at to look at detrusor sphincter dysenergia, the bladder neck status on fluoroscopy and EMG synergy were very unreliable. And why might this be? So I have some example tracing. So in contrast to the tracing that I had um, on the previous slide, where you just have one line kind of going up, here you've got a, a detrusor pressure that goes up, you've got a leak, it goes back down again. So you're measuring a detrusor leak point pressure in the absence of a contraction. So if you call this a contraction, do you measure it here? Do you measure it here? So one number is less than 40, one number is greater than 40. And so there's some interpretation differences there. Detrusor sphincter dysenergia is even harder. Um, when Dr. Bauer um, published his initial study and, and still to this date, uses needle electrodes um, to measure EMG, um, also with a, a neuroelectrophysiologist with them to help interpret them. And now those needle electrodes aren't commercially available and uh, almost 
all pediatric urologists other than Dr. Bauer are using patch EMGs, the surface patch EMGs. And they're a little, they're a much harder to interpret, much more sensitive to, to leakage on them. And so looking at this tracing, there are detrusor contractions here and there's some increased EMG activity. But when this tracing was matched up with a fluoroscopic image, this, this wasn't detrusor sphincter dysinergia. Um, an even more common um, reason it's difficult to interpret is in many of these newborn neurodynamics, the babies are, are moving. And so there's a lot of movement artifact. And so you, um, that you have these detrusor contractions or that are potentially due to movement because you see some um, contractions in the, um, you see some other contractions as well in the abdominal tracing. But you have a lot of EMG activity that maybe looks like it's correlated to the detrusor contractions, but very hard to tell. And so detrusor sphincter dysinergia is very, is, is, has very low inter-rater reliability. Now, we specifically looked at this um, in, in the umpire group at the different sites because different people interpret these differently. And so when we looked at, and we were concerned about this issue just because um, pediatric urologists who had been involved in other trials in neurogenic bladder um, looking at urodynamics were well aware the, of these interpretation differences. And so when we looked at our first 150 or so and had three reviewers look at the same tracing, we had very low agreement. Um, this is 58% among three reviewers. But after going through all of these uh, uh, with urologists from all nine sites, I think we were able to come up with a good standardization. But that just um, emphasizes the importance of, of a standardization of technique, a standardization of interpretation, and then education on, on what that is so that we're all talking the same language. Um, moving away from urodynamics a little bit, so we use the urodynamics to predict um, risk. Um, and CIC and anticholinergics can decrease that um, um, risk of re renal deterioration. There are some times where CIC and anticholinergics aren't enough, and that decision can be based on urodynamics. It can be based on imaging, such as worsening reflux or hydronephrosis, or, or in clinical history, just recurrent febrile UTIs. And that's when you might need to do something additional. Um, there are temporizing surgical procedures that you can do. Um, a, a vesicostomy um, a typically will do in a, um, a, 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 an individual and a child who might be uh, considered too young or, or not ready for augmentation. Um, I put that as temporizing. I mean, temp theoretically, you can have a vesicostomy forever. It's just harder to manage in terms of continence just because you can't put an appliance over the vesicostomy. It's not designed for that. Um, urethral dilatation can decrease detrusor leak point pressure, um, and that's been reported. It's not something that, that I use that frequently, but one of my partners uses um, urethral dilatation in conjunction um, with botulinum toxin. Um, and, and that combination while they're there for the botulinum toxin anyway. Um, and then botulinum toxin um, in the bladder in, in small reports have been shown to decrease detrusor overactivity and to increase compliance. Um, in the pediatric neurogenic bladder dysfunction population, it's considered an off-label use. And in, in my practice, and I think most, uh, a lot of people have found this, that it's a little bit better for the detrusor overactivity than it is for um, decreasing compliance, especially once you have detrusor leak point pressures that are approaching um, 40 centimeters of water. And then finally, augmentation cystoplasty, um, which I'll get back to when we're talking about continence. Um, I'm going to go next to sexual function and reproductive function. And honestly, um, I'm, Carmen Tong is more of an expert in this than I am. She just wrote a, a review article on this. Um, um, but this is really an, an area of pediatric spina bifida that needs a lot of attention. Um, I think it's been really kind of understood for a while that, that there are spina bifida specific issues associated with pregnancy and delivery. Um, Dr. John Thomas and Dr. Mark Adams, who are our partners, wrote the review article more than 10 years ago. And I think this was well known even back then, just because a, a typical scenario would be an individual with spina bifida may have had bladder reconstruction and a lower urinary tract uh, reconstruction as a child. 
now they're an, they, an adult, they found a partner, now they're pregnant, and urology will get consulted about helping with that delivery planning or being involved in that delivery. Um, even in the absence of any prior surgeries, there are issues um, that can complicate delivery. Um, the, the, for vaginal delivery, is the bony anatomy appropriate? Um, can the can the young woman um, generate a sufficient Valsalva effort to push? Um, pelvic prolapse is, is not uncommon, and so delivery can exacerbate that. Um, for vaginal delivery, anything that's associated with the bladder outlet, it, it can be a concern, obviously. So prior bladder neck reconstruction, artificial urinary sphincter, or other incontinence procedures. Um, for C-sections, um, in addition to the VP shunts, the, the concern is, is there's been previous reconstruction. Um, you don't want to damage the augment. You don't want to damage the catheterizable channels. And you also don't want to damage the mesenteries to those structures which can be considerably distorted by the gravid uterus. So that, that's been something that, that you're all just been aware of for a long time. Um, but again, going back to the graph where life expectancy is increasing, you have more healthy adults, you have increasing delivery rates. Um, so this is something that um, Dr. Courtney Sura at Michigan looked at. Um, that we, in the past 10 years, this is a little, um, a little bit of an older paper now, but in the past 10 years, um, the number of spina bifida deliveries has increased over time. Um, and so that there are more deliveries. Um, but one of the things that I think anyone who's taking care of a, a lot of these, these young women who have prior blood, lower urinary tract reconstructions who get pregnant are, is a common thing that they will say is, I didn't even realize that I could become pregnant. Um, and that's a huge disservice to that population. Um, as, as a whole, the population is less knowledgeable than their peers. They're less likely to use birth control. And they're, they report that they're rarely provided any specific information related to the spina bifida. Um, it, it, Dr. Soror did some structured interviews with women who were, uh, um, over 16, and, and a majority of them were sexually active, and they brought up concerns that, you know, that they, no one really talked to them about it. They were being, they felt that they were perceived as being asexual, um, that they were looking for sources of sex education, but just didn't have them. Um, they really didn't get anything spina bifida specific, um, and they, they'd like, in, they'd like to have information on spina bifida specific factors on sexual encounters, and, and this is the scary thing. They, they felt that the perceived that there was a relationship between that low sexual self-confidence from not having that education and the risk for sexual assault. And so there's a huge opportunity to promote sexual health, but to also limit sexually transmitted infections, unintended pregnancy, and, and potential exploitation. Um, and so why does this fall to the urologist, the pediatric urologist? Well, I don't think it all falls to the pediatric urologist, but in, in our transition experience, you know, to see an adult urologist, um, you have to have a referral from primary care. Oftentimes, um, a, a lot of our young patients, our young adult patients, were, we found that they were seeing their spina bifida providers, um, neurosurgery, urology on a yearly basis. And so they felt that that was their doctor that they were going to. And so once they passed the age of needing vaccinations, that they didn't have primary care. So that's been something that we're addressing. But if they don't have a strong primary care person that they're seeing and they're just seeing you, you may be the only one there to talk to them about it. Um, both Dr. Stroer um, at Michigan and Dr. Weiner are, are two pediatric urologists who are working on this. Um, the Spina Bifida As uh, Association has um, some healthcare guidelines and they have some specific guidelines for men's health as well as women's health. And I, I put this up here just for it to be a resource, but even though you might not be able to provide all that information, I think it's important for pediatric urologists to at least start that dialogue and, and help those individuals find someone who can continue that dialogue with them. So for men's health, this shouldn't be a problem for any pediatric urologist um, who's, uh, um, who's trained in a, a residency where you've seen adult urologists, uh, you've seen adult urology because this is just regular adult urology, um, you know, talking about erectile function or orgasmic function, ejaculatory function. 
really there shouldn't be any problems of at least bringing these issues up. Now, you might not be the one who has expertise on how you're going to address erectile dysfunction in someone who's um, got neurogenic issues or how you're going to um, uh, have them achieve um, ejaculate or chore function. You don't have to be that expert, but certainly you can open up that dialogue. Um, I think women's health is a little bit different, uh, more difficult as a urologist because in, that's not a standard part of your residency since that's more of a obstetric gynecology. But again, um, I think bringing up that dialogue is, is, is something that pediatric urologists can do. And then to collaborate with others to, to fill in those gaps. Um, and, and so I, there, so there are pediatric urologists working on addressing those knowledge gaps, but I think what's important is, is where you may be practicing, different people have different comfort levels and different expertise. And so it, it really, it's just important to talk to as many people as possible and say, hey, there's this issue, do you know someone who can help with this? Because there might be someone in, in adolescent medicine and who this is their interest, or, um, or you know, someone in obstetrics or a fertility specialist or someone who's an adult urologist in FPMRS or a male reconstructive urologist or someone in, in, in PMNR. And so really, I, I think in spina bifida, um, really just the more people that you can get involved and sort of have touch base with, I think the, um, the, the, the better we can serve our patients. Um, the, the final category is, is continence. Um, and continence is a huge issue to individuals with spina bifida. Um, the Spina Bifida Association sent out a survey to um, individuals with spina bifida and their caregivers, both to children and to adults. And urinary continence was a priority concern for everyone um, queried. Um, Dr. Conrad Zemanski at Indiana has done some great studies looking at continence and health-related quality of life. And as the quantity of incontinence, urinary incontinence increases, um, the, the health-related quality of life goes down. And so there's a, a, a correlation between those two. And so the better continence you have, the better health-related quality of life that you can have. So, so where are we now? Um, so this is data from the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry, which involves multiple sites across the United States. Uh, it's important to know that these sites are sites that have multidisciplinary spina bifida clinics. They've got a minimum number of spina bifida patients. And so really these sites are, are sort of sites of experts. Um, this study also includes non-myelom and meningocele patients. So if anything, you'd expect these results to be um, better than those for just purely myelomeningocele patients. Only 50% were continent. And in adults, um, about a quarter of them had at least, at least one surgery for continence. Now, is prenatal, uh, prenatal closure going to make this better? So I didn't address prenatal closure in the renal function section just because that data really isn't mature enough. Usually you're looking at renal function ir um, deterioration starting in, in adolescence for the most part. Um, but we can look at continence issues um, with, a, with this, these group of patients. So MOMS um, was an NIH, is an NIH funded study um, that uh, involved three clinical sites. Um, and their first paper on bladder function came out in 2015, and it really wasn't a continence paper. What they were looking at was need for CIC at 30 months, and their uh, defined indications for CIC were, were urodynamics, worsening hydronephrosis, recurrent UTI, so mostly sort of more renal type issues, not continence issues. And they found with those strict indications, um, they did, did not reduce the need for CIC. So a, a more recent uh, paper that came out last year was looking more at sort of those toilet training type issues. Um, uh, and their outcomes were CIC and family reported volitional avoiding. Um, and so the, the criteria are a little bit subjective. The CIC, there wasn't those defined indications as before. It was just whether they were on CIC or not. And so there could some, be some provider variability. Um, and then also family reported volitional avoiding. And so what they found was that there was 
less CIC, more volitional avoiding. So um, the suggestion that, that things with continents might be better, but not specifically measuring continents. Um, there are two studies um, that looked at prenatal closure in continents. One was um, Dr. Antonio's study out of Brazil. Um, and this looked at 14 patients in his prospective database um, who had had prenatal closure. And their average age at the time of the study was um, just under six years old. And the outcome that he was measuring was leakage. Um, and so three had no leakage, six had mild leakage, five had moderate to severe, um, 11 were, were using diapers. And so results there may be not so great for continents in that population. Um, there was a study out of Poland that also looked at continents and their outcome was, was very well defined. Um, all their patients were on CIC and anticholinergic and what their outcome they were looking at was pad weight between those every three hour catheterizations and they defined dry as less than 10 milliliters. And you can see from this graph that um, the, the prenatal closures are in the darker gray. Um, more of the prenatal closures were dry um, compared to the postnatal closures. And so again, um, looking like the prenatal closure might have a, a, a good effect on continents. However, as you can see from all these, all these studies, um, there are certainly patients who are still going to have problems with continents. But that's okay, we have the spina bifida urology surgery toolbox. Um, you know, bladder augmentation, catheterizable channels can be used for, for renal preservation, but also for continence. But also specific um, procedures for continence like sling, artificial urinary sphincter, bladder neck reconstruction, and bladder neck closure. Um, interestingly, when you look again at the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry, um, and looking at rates of these types of procedures among the various sites, and again, sites with a minimum number of spina bifida patients, um, a multidisciplinary clinic considered expert sites, there was a large variation in the number of surgeries. Um, and, and of course, you might have patient variation, but to have a, a threefold difference seems like a lot. And so I think that there are a lot of provider-based variabilities contributing to this. And so are we doing too many surgeries? Are, are we doing not enough? I don't think we know the answer to that question. You know, there are some reports in the adult, um, adult neurogenic bladder population that, that more surgery is good. Um, in, in a single study, a study of adults with spina bifida, they found that those with augmentation were more independent. Um, in a multi-center study uh, of neurogenic bladder, not with spina bifida, um, but with spinal cord injury, they found a better quality of life with augmentation. Um, so, so why are we so hesitant? You know, so more surgery can be maybe not so good. Um, Dr. Doug Hoosman at the Mayo Clinic, um, who has a really unique population where he sees a large number of young adults who've had um, complex um, lower urinary tract surgery as children, uh, recently published uh, about the risk of early augmentation during the transition to adulthood. Um, and found a bladder rupture rate in young adults of about 3%, often decades after their initial procedure, and found an association between substance use, um, non-compliance with catheterization, and, and disabilities that require a sur surrogate to perform a monitor catheterization. And, and so why might this be? Uh, certainly um, in all adults as they're and uh, in, in all adolescents as they're tra and transition to adulthood you may not be doing the best health care maintenance in your early 20s um, and that uh, across the board um, but also for individuals with spina bifida who had these uh, had these procedures done as children um, you know as an eight-year-old you may have had an appendico vesicostomy created that catheterizes perfectly, that your parent was able to catheterize with no difficulty. But then as you become an adult, um, with issues like obesity um, and having a panis, that catheterization may not be so easy anymore. And, and you might not have your parent doing that, able to do that catheterization now that you've taken it over for yourself. Um, and so there are a, a lot of difficult, a lot of reasons why it can both from um, a lot of reasons why that becomes more difficult for the individual. 
Um, we also know that more surgery can lead to more surgery. Um, this is a study out of Indiana looking at their single institution results. And when you're talking about um, bladder, um, bladder neck reconstruction, um, these types of things, um, I Indiana is an expert, expert, expert site. And so they looked at their bladder outlet reconstruction long-term outcomes. And after a single procedure, 20 to 30% were wet. And so um, patients need to go into this understanding that one procedure may not get them completely dry. Um, the other thing is, is that about half um, had a deteriorating bladder that required an augmentation or re-augmentation. So even if they are able to get dry, it, it may potentially put their kidneys at risk, something that they need to be, needs to be followed. And so that's the bladder outlet part. The bladder augmentation part can also have complications. Again, out of Indiana, um, about just a little under a half had complications that led to more surgeries, the most common being um, kidney stones and then also um, perforation. And then the channels, the channels can lead to more surgery. Um, if you look at catheterizable channels um, with a risk of sub, uh, and looking at the risk of need, need for a subfascial revision at 10 years, um, it's relatively low for an appendicovesicostomy, about one in 12. Um, but, but still, when you think about it, it's, a little, it's just under 10%. Um, for a Monty, one in six, and for a spiral Monty, one in three. Um, and so again, these surgeries um, that you may potentially be doing for quality of life issues may need revisions, and the families and the individuals need to be aware of that. Um, I, I made this slide because I, I wanted to highlight how important it is for the patient's preferences and values to match the treatment. So if you think about the Burger King Whopper in the advertisement, so the perfect Burger King Whopper, as like your perfect bladder augmentation, your perfect catheterizable channel, your perfect bladder neck reconstruction, you can learn the surgery, you can improve your skills so that you've got this sort of crappy looking burger Whopper and then make it into the advertisement looking one. So you can just do that by improving your surgery technique. And so if you present this perfect Burger King Whopper to a patient um, and they're vegan, that's not what they wanted. And so it's, it's so important, and Dr. Yerkes um, alluded to this in her talk, is that as you're thinking about these complex procedures, just really important to understand what the patient values are, what their preferences are, and how you can best meet those. I'm going to end with two cases um, just to sort of illustrate this and, and some of the things that, that I worry about and I think about. Um, the first case um, is a six-year-old girl that, uh, that I saw for the first time when I first started practice. She's a, a young adult now. Um, and she had, had urology, urology care somewhere else. They had started her on intermittent catheterization and anticholinergic um, and, and really wasn't having a, a lot of problems. She had also had a mace by a um, pediatric surgeon because of neurogenic bowel issues. Super happy about the mace that helped her her continent her fecal continence. Um, she was dry on um, on CIC for her urethra and uh, on anticholinergic, but she was having some febrile UTIs. But, uh, but the, mom, the main reason she was there was the mom really wanted a catheterizable channel in the umbilicus because the mace, she, they were so happy with the mace that she, the mom wanted her to be able to manage her bladder independently. And uh, there's a lot of information on Facebook groups, chat rooms, different things. For, for uh, There's a, a really good supportive spina bifida community that, that talks to each other. And so a, a lot um, of, of families will hear things from other families. And so they had, they knew about catheterized, she knew about catheterizable channels. She knew someone who had an umbilical stoma, that's what she wanted. And, I, and so I had come out of practice and I'm like, I, I know how to do that, I can give that to her. And so I did the urodynamics um, you know, in preparation just to check her bladder before I did this. I found detrusor over activity and elevated leak point pressure. And so she got the ilio augmentation cystoplasty for renal preservation. But because she wanted that catheterizable channel to the umbilicus, and she had already had the mace, so I couldn't use her appendix, in order to reach the umbilicus, I had to use a, a spiral monte. Spiral monte has a high uh, rate of, of, of stenosis, like we saw in that previous graph. 
So nine months later, she had stomal stenosis. And so I talked to the mom about doing a revision, but she said, no, she declined it because um, uh, this young girl was now catheterizing for her urethra independently. She didn't need the, she didn't need the stoma. Two years later, she had a bladder stone and over the next three years, she had seven procedures for recurrent bladder stones. On that seventh procedure, while we were looking in her bladder and taking care of her bladder stone, from what was left of the stoma, I saw what looked like toothpaste sort of oozing out of the, the old, um, of the old um, spiral monte tract. And so we excised that spiral monte tract and after that, she didn't have any more stones. And so why do I present this case? One is, is that um, the, the mace, that was sort of out of our control, but you know, the, I think the appendix is super important. And, um, and so for kids, we, we do focus on neurogenic bowel very, very um, at, at a young age with our gastroenterologists. Um, but as much as possible, we try to have them exhaust all medical things, such including parasine, just because with, with parasine now, it is something where you can do it independently to help to preserve that appendix if we need it. The other point is, is that she had specifically asked for an umbilical catheterizable channel, but what she wanted was, was for her daughter to be able to be independent with her toileting. And so now um, we have an occupational therapist who we work with and, and we would have set, I would have set her up with a visit with her to, uh, to work on that toileting and maybe we could have found out that, okay, this is what you need to do to be able to catheterize your urethra on your own. Um, had we done that and we didn't do this catheterizable channel, I, I could have probably saved her these eight procedures. And so uh, when, when I think Fran was asked for something, I think you just need to dig a little bit deeper and see, okay, what, what are your priorities? Not what specific surgery are you asking for, but what priorities? What, what's important to you? Um, the second case is, that I'm going to present is, is just some of my worries about spina bifida and taking care of children. So I'm very fortunate to work with Dr. Nicole Miller and Dr. Melissa Kaufman at Vanderbilt. They're both adult urologists. Um, Dr. Nicole Miller specializes in stones, which, I, which you saw before is a, a big problem for individuals with spina bifida. And um, Dr. Melissa Kaufman is a reconstructive urologist. And so uh, this patient that I'm presenting is, is one of their patients, uh, one of their patients, and not someone that, uh, not someone that I took care of previously, but just gives you a glimpse at, at things, potential um, consequences, long, long-term consequences of things that we do when, when these individuals are children. Um, and so this is a 35-year-old man with spina bifida. And at 15, um, he had low bladder compliance um, and underwent a sigmoid augmentation cystoplasty. And he was doing well, he was catheterizing, he was um, irrigating. Um, and he was mostly dry during the daytime, but was, but was wet um, mostly at night, and this was bothersome to him. And so he underwent a bladder neck reconstruction, um, a, a re-augment with ileum and an appendicular vesicostomy. Post-operatively, I, I can't re exactly remember all the issues uh, in the chart, but he was having some detrusor, um, he ended up getting urodynamics that showed detrusor overactivity and worsening hydronephrosis. And so he was identified as someone who, okay, this is someone that we're gonna need to watch. He, he, and he, but he stayed dry, and the, the bladder neck reconstruction worked well. And so again, in his 20s to 30s, he, he wasn't lost to follow up, he came in, um, but not as regularly as he did when he was a child. And if you think for the time when you were 20 to 30, how often were you going to the physician if you were feeling well? Um, and so he had hydronephrosis, but that had been stable. He was dry between catheterizations. He was catheterizing regularly. So there, there, there weren't any warning flags. Um, when he was 30 years old, he came for an emergency room visit because he was having recurrent episodes of suprapubic cellulitis. Um, and at that point, he was found to have a cutaneous fistula um, to the bladder augment. At that point, he was also found to, to have um, um, stage three chronic kidney disease, which um, which sort of fell by the wayside because he was doing well. And then since that emergency room visit, he was found to have a urethral stricture, recurrent UTIs, recurrent bladder and kidney stones, and, and now is on the transplant list. 
And so the, I don't know if there's necessarily a learning point from that, but just a, a lot of things can happen and you, you have to think, well, is my surgery going to affect these things or make these bad things? It, 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 will it do good things, but also think, or well, what bad things could it do? Um, I just have a few take home points. One is, is that you always have to think that the kidneys are at risk, even if patients are doing well. It, it's something that you have to consider because those kidneys need to last a long time if, if individuals are living into their 70s and 80s. Quality of life issues are important. Um, the, the continence among sexual, sexual and re reproductive health. I, I put this beneficence, non maleficism respect for autonomy. Those are um, things that you talk about in, in bioethics. And usually we come across it when we're filling out um, our IRB, um, when we're doing our IRB training about research. But I think it really applies to the individuals who have spina bifida and taking care of them as well. You want their an intervention to to do good for them. You want beneficence, but you also don't want it to do something bad, either in the short term or in the long term, so non-maleficence. And the respect for autonomy is, is, especially for the quality of life issues, I think you need to have those individuals and families involved in, in really looking to think what their, their values and their preferences are so you can help them achieve those. And then finally, that with this particular um, subject, spina bifida, collaboration with others, with other pediatric urologists, adult urologists, primary care, other specialties, ancillary staff and patients and advocacy groups is so important. Um, I just put this up as some resources, um, just so that you're aware that they're there. Again, the, the EAU ESP Neurogenic Bladder Guidelines just published in 2020. The SPA, um, Spina Bifida Association, has healthcare guidelines on their site, um, not just for urology, but for, for really across the um, spectrum of, of medicine. And then the International Children's Continent Society also have guidelines about the neurogenic letter. And so uh, I think now we're at the question point. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Tanaka, for a fantastic lecture, uh, very comprehensive on spina bifida. We've got some questions here uh, from our participants. So I'm going to start off uh, on renal function um, based on your talk. The first question is, what is your opinion on glomerular hyperfiltration in this type of patients? <laughs> Let's start out with an easy nephrology question. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think, I think each spina bifida patient is, is, is different in terms of that. I mean, I think that there's certainly you know, there, there are individuals where one kidney is, is definitely more affected than the other and you've got a, a sick solitary kidney and so you've got those, those sort of concerns. I, I think I specifically, just because I'm not smart enough to be a nephrologist, don't specifically worry about the, the mechanism, but I do worry about the risk. And so we work closely with the nephrologists about special screening at different ages um, and, and, and regular surveillance um, and and just working closely with the nephrologists who are a lot smarter than I am. That answers um, the second question, which was, do you work together with a nephrologist? And a follow-up question on that, uh, oh. how do you make oh. nephro protection tips for these uh, patients or renal okay. protection? Yeah, so, um, so we, uh, we work really closely with a, a nephrologist. Dr. Renee Vanderboord um, is our nephrologist who wor helps work with the spina bifida patients. Um, so realistically, I think before we in were involved in the CDC studies, I think we checked serum creatinine or any kidney serum levels for kids very infrequently. Um, unless we were specifically concerned about it, like findings on ultrasound or, or you know, some, some other um, clinical reason. But um, we sometimes did surveillance, but we weren't really good about it, mostly because the, having the toddlers and the blood draws. And, and so we, we, thought, we, we thought to ourselves, okay, if the ultrasound looks good, then we're good. It, it's not that important. Um, you, you all probably know that the, the EG, the serum creatinine is not the best um, thing, not the best way to measure kidney function in children with spina bifida because of muscle mass issues. 
But if you've got a calculated EGFR that is low in a spina bifida patient, yeah, it's, it's probably really low. Um, um, but if anything, the, the EGFR is, is overestimated when you use those creatinine, um, creatinine equations in spina bifida. And so uh, we started getting spina bif uh, serum creatinine regularly because of the CDC projects. And what we found was is that even with normal renal ultrasound, you could have low EGFR based on those serum creatinines. And so we came up with a, um, a, a sort of a screening, a, a number screening at um, where we, at below a certain number, we sent to send a nephrology. Those, those numbers, the EGFR numbers aren't great under less than two. And so we're pretty, uh, we're a little bit um, more liberal with those numbers and, and less than two. But we, we came up with some internal guidelines for, for referral to nephrology. Is there a recommended age or weight when you would start using Botox? We've used it in pretty young kids. Um, you know, there, there are some um, weights based on dose uh, or dose based on weights. And so um, I think just as a cutoff, you know, once over 10 kilograms, that's not really based on anything, but I think that you can use them in, in very young children. And do you use Mirabegron or Merbetric or Vesicure if the patient is having side effects from oxybutynin, or would you move to intradetrusor oxybutynin? So it, we offer it to patients. Again, the big limitation is, is that um, sometimes when they're having problems, they're still too small to swallow pills. Um, and so we'll, we'll use a combination of both. We'll I'll provide both those options to parents and see, um, see what their preference is. Okay, great. Um, here's a question for the sexual reproductive function. If you aren't treating ED in adolescent males with spina bifida, do you refer to an andrologist or a sexual medicine expert, or would you refer to general urology? So that's where you have to see who in your community um, does this, just because I think it's gonna vary from person to person, and that's where your outreach to people who are practicing in your community is so helpful. Um, for example, you know, when I was a resident, there was a fertility specialist who had some interest in, in um, not just sort of the neurogenic fertility um, ejaculatory function, but also in the erect, uh, erectile function. And so he, he was that person in that community. Um, I, I think um, in, in other communities, it might be the um, adult sexual medicine specialist. And so I think it's what's going to differ. I don't think that there's one specialty who you can say, oh, that's the, that's the person. And it, it's, it really is just based on who has the interest in it. And so it takes a little bit to find that person in your community. Perfect. What age would you recommend uh, for continent channel surgeries like Mitrofenov? And would you recommend simultaneous neurogenic bowel surgery like MACE? Um, so the, the bowel stuff we address we like to address early. So um, we have a um, gastroenterology nurse practitioner who we work with. She used to be a urology nurse practitioner. And so she starts seeing the newborns um, when they first come to clinic and then really start in working on sort of a, a really active bowel program in terms of, of enemas for continents, usually at about two years of age. Um, you know, I, I think they're the ones who help us figure, okay, when a, a child is ready for, for MACE. And I think that if a child is ready for MACE before they're ready for bladder, I, I think that's okay. I think the, you know, it's, it's standard used to be, you know, do everything all at once, the plate special, do the, the augment, the catheterized book channel, the MACE at the same time. But I, I think you can do it earlier and do the bladder later. Um, I think that's okay. Um, and then the other question was, when the, is the minimum age for a catheterizable channel? I don't think there's necessarily a minimum age. Um, I do think that, um, that all these children, just because of the developmental differences, are, are, are ready for it at different times. I do like the children to be old enough so that they understand what the surgery is for and what they're getting into. And so at least they can verbalize, this is 
I mean, they're not going to be able to say I'm getting a catheterizable channel, but there's, you know, they're going to understand that they're catheterizing to get, you know, urine out through their abdomen. Okay. Do you have a process to gauge readiness of child and parents to undergo quality of life procedures and what pearls would you recommend? That's a great question. You know, First of all, if there are people in, like if you've got nurses in your clinic who who are talking to the family more over the phone, I would definitely listen to them. Um, before, when we're seriously thinking about a continence procedure, I'll get social work involved, um, and so they'll sit in on the conversation of, of of me talking about the surgery more in depth and what to expect, and you know they'll they'll ask questions like, okay, you know you're you're at school, the nurse who usually helps you catheterize isn't there, what are you going to do? Just thinking out sort of some of those situations or like, oh, you, um, your parents are working late, you're with your grandma, you know, and having the families think out those situations. And so I think social work has been really helpful. I think the nurses have been really helpful, but I, I think the, I think the child has to understand at, at least on a basic level what's being done to them. Because ultimately, they're going to be the ones as an adult who takes care of it. Uh, how and when do you try spontaneous voiding and in which type of patients? Spontaneous voiding. Um, so in children who urodynamics are safe and there's not a concern for renal preservation, um, and so they're not already on catheterization, I'll have... Um, families, um, if they want to go through regular toilet training and then just see, you know, how far they go with it. And so just like what you would do for regular toilet training for a child without spina bifida. Uh, I don't think there's a reason not to try it if you have safe bladder characteristics. Uh, can you talk about your experience with bladder neck slings and when, when would you do it? So, um, you know, bladder neck slings don't work that well in, um, boys, particularly in ambulatory boys. Um, I'll use slings a lot in girls, um, and then uh, in boys, I often use it to uh, as an adjunct to bladder neck reconstruction procedure. Okay. Uh, and uh, this goes back to Botox, which I think you partially answered already. Uh, when do you decide to start Botox, and how do you, more, impo uh, more importantly, follow up these patients who have had Botox? Um, so, for the Botox, um, if I see, so there are a couple of situations where I'll use it. If, um, family, if the individuals don't, aren't tolerating the anticholinergic, I'll, I'll try it for that. Um, if, if they're on anticholinergic, but it looks like there's some, you know, worsening detrusor overactivity, I'll try it for that. Or if there's, um, if there's the compliance is not so good, the family is not ready for an augment just psychologically, I'll go ahead and try it for that. Um, and, and then also if um, for, for detrusive overactivity and they're catheterizing and there's some continence issues, I'll try it for that. If I'm purely doing it for continence, I won't necessarily check urodynamics afterwards. So if I'm not really that worried about their kidneys, I won't necessarily check it, but if I'm doing it for, for compliant issue, compliance issues or um, really sort of worsening of server activity, um, then I'll check it about six weeks afterwards. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, is there a specific reason why slings work better for females? I am sure it is, uh, like, I bet someone smart has an answer to that. Um, and I'm sure it's an anatomical reason, and I don't have a good answer to that. Good way to pick a good last question, Carmen. Hey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanaka. Uh, and thank you, Hillary, for doing this. And good night, everyone, and enjoy Cinco de Mayo. Woo!